苦しいしかしこれが冒険冒険それはマリオの定め After a 20 year sibling rivalry, Mario and Luigi team up using synchronized super moves. Hey, Jan, go inside, Daddy. Ne. Ah, shut. Kawaii. Okay. Let's practice some cannon launches. Prepare your baby for battle. Mario and Luigi partners in time. Mario and Luigi. Luigi, wait. Hi. It's been a bit. Are these types of videos still popular? I haven't been paying attention. Eh, who cares. It's been 20 years since Alpha Dream's Mario & Luigi RPG series started. Lasting 5 mainline games and 2 remakes, starting from 2003's Superstar Saga to 2019's Bowser's Inside Story remake. Although the series is nowhere near the most popular Mario spin-off, it is definitely a fan favourite. Evidence being the reaction to Alpha Dream going bankrupt in October of 2019. Fans were noticeably upset. Afterwards, the series remained dormant. The most we got was when Superstar Saga was re-released via Nintendo Switch Online in 2023. While the series was never perfect and known for its groundbreaking stories, it had extremely fun gameplay mechanics. It changed the traditional RPG style in ways that resulted in people who normally don't care for RPGs still enjoying it, with its controlling both brothers at the same time gimmick being a big standout. The main battle style is well liked, and on top of all this, the writing overall was really fun. It gave characters that people fondly remember, with original characters, like for example Fawful, being one of the most iconic Mario villains. Despite only appearing in this series, how the classic characters were handled were also pretty good. For example Bowser, who has some of his best outings here, with my favourite interpretation of the character coming from this series. Alright, that's enough glazing. Now, I've gone over how fondly remembered this series is. I don't think I got to tell you that it also spawned plenty of fan content. And well, iceberg charts. You know, facts, fan theories, unhinged ramblings about insert topic here. Took over YouTube in 2020? Yeah, those. With enough history, it's almost inevitable that people will drop down some of these topics and obscure shit to compile them into one of these things. And for this video, I'll be covering two of them. Yes, two. The first by Afid Kirby, and the second by Particular Product 55, both from Reddit. It should also be noted that the second chart is quite long. What I've seen, the average chart is like eight layers. This one has 21. I could cover all of it in a single overly long video, but no one's trying to see that. So for this video, I'll only be covering the first eight layers, the same length as the first one, with hopes that I can cover the rest another time, whenever I feel like. Then afterwards, I probably won't make another iceberg again. With that out the way, let's delve into some interesting parts of this franchise's history. Fawful in Partners in Time. In the second game in this series, Partners in Time, Fawful makes a brief reappearance. He is seen inside the pipes of Peach's Castle Dungeon, running the Beans and Badges shop, where he will sell rare badges in exchange for beans. When you meet him for the first time, he will go on a rant about how angry he is about what happened in the last game. but then goes on about how he's waiting to come back, foreshadowing his role as the main villain of the next game, Bowser's Inside Story. The pipe yard features a room filled with coloured wrought pipes that are there to give Mario and Luigi shortcuts to each area, as well as get them in and out of Bowser. These most likely got here when Bowser inhaled everything at the start of the game. I can't imagine where else they would have come from. Like imagine if he was born with them. 
However, one thing of note is that one of the pipes is noticeably broken, with no way of knowing where it could have taken you to. The main antagonists of Partners in Time, the Shroobs, were seemingly defeated at the end of the game, after their weakness was discovered. However, in the next game, it is revealed that Bowser may have kept some of them. An optional boss fight against three of them can be found in Bowser's Inside Story, found in the Frozen Preservation Room. Earlier in the game, a Shroob can be found in the 4 4 Theatre. If you interact with it, it just stares blankly without saying anything. Luigi has a crush on Peasley. Weird way to follow up the last one, I know. This was one I did not think much of at first. Originally wrote it off as nothing. But having replayed the game for the first time in literal years, yeah, I definitely see it a bit more now. Luigi X Peasley is a surprisingly popular ship in the MNL fandom. I think. To the point where the shipping wiki has gone out of the way to document all of the scenes that could potentially support all of this. Scenes that indicate that Luigi has a crush on the guy. From blushing after being complimented, crying after the dude goes off on his own to Bowser's castle, just overall fanboying the fuck out of him whenever in the same scene as each other, crying after feeling to give him a hug. <laughs> now all of this could be explained by saying that Luigi is just starstruck, easily being a celebrity and all, which let's be real, it's most likely what's going on. But others have also pointed out scenes from the other side, Peasley showing more respect and having favoritism towards Luigi. Luigi being the only one he calls by his actual name, frequently compliments and gives key items to. There's also the famous, iconic, ass poking scene. Kirby Story, one of the four movie posters seen in Superstar Saga's Yoshi Theater, specifically the GBA version. The other three being Wario, MNL, and Legend of Starfy. There is nothing more to this than it being an easter egg referencing Kirby, but I am definitely interested in that Wario movie. Alright, there is this game changing plot twist in Superstar Saga right before the Beanstar Shadows, where it is revealed that Rookie, Popple Psychic, is Bowser. But yeah, in all seriousness, he's Bowser with amnesia. Bowser's minions actually gives more context behind this. During the Hoo Hoo Mountain area, we see the aftermath of where Bowser gets launched out of a cannon. He is walking around starving, then next time we see him, he is being carried by Fawful in front of a waterfall before getting dropped. Before getting bonked by Captain Goomba. Then, he loses his memory, and then collapses because of hunger. Afterwards, he meets Popple after he accidentally fed them food he stole, then both run away, while being chased by guards. Okay, so there's more shown afterwards, but for the sake of time, I won't go into everything. It can all be seen by playing Bowser's Minions, or by watching all the cutscenes on YouTube. Gino. Gino is a character that debuted in Mario's first RPG, Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars, created by Square. However, he hasn't appeared much since. One of the times he reappeared was cameoing in Superstar Saga, as a host of one of the minigames in Little Fungi Town's arcade. In the remake, however, the minigame has no host, as Gino does not return. This is most likely because of copyright reasons. Square still owns everything that was original in Super Mario RPG. This is also the widely accepted reason why we rarely ever see Gino. The original game's credits even mention him as being owned by Square Enix. Anyway, so there's a remake now. Let's go! Okie dokie! The Alpha Cretin, or Keratin in the British version, yeah, I don't know. It's one of the bosses in Bowser's Inside Story. A group of molecule... things that people have noticed looks very similar to Alpha Dream's logo, with one of the things supporting the comparison being two of the colours it turned into. 
which match up with the logo. That being said, it hasn't been confirmed if this was intentional or not. Superstar Saga's Guaha Lagoon features two enemies that go completely unnamed, only being referred to as three question marks. A green cheap cheap with a shark fin, and a skeleton shark. The two of them are always paired together, obviously hiding their name is to make it hard to tell which is which when they attack, as both of them hide in the sand. In the official player's guide's enemy list, the name Sharkbone shows up, which is the skeleton shark's real name. The Cheap Cheap's real name is Sand Cheap, but the guide incorrectly calls it Puffer Cheap. Both names are also mentioned in the remake's easy mode, but also go unused in the original game's code. In Superstar Saga's penultimate battle against Fawful, on top of getting his weird as fuck costume, he also grows an electric antenna that he attacks with, something that's never seen anywhere else in the game. This antenna reappears in his Partners in Time cameo, and Bowser's inside story during the final boss with the Dark Star attached, if you count it. Fawful in Smash. I'm not 100% sure what this is referring to, but I have two possible conclusions. So consider this a double topic, because I'm stupid. God, I'll be pissed if neither of these are right. Number one. In Smash Ultimate, Fawful does have a spirit battle, a stamina fight against Iggy, as well as a green rob, who I assume is meant to represent the McCawfuls. Iggy has a rocket belt, and Bowser's Inside Story's final boss music plays in the background. Number two. When you are selecting your player name on the character select screen, there is an option to have a randomly generated name. A lot of these names are weird. I love some of these. There are even some references to other games in these. And the reason why this is being brought up is because the name Fawful is one of them. There are also the fan-made Fido concepts, but it's nothing official. But yeah, that's all the Fawful references in Smash that I know of. Wario and Waluigi sequel to Bowser's Inside Story. This is a very popular fan concept. This topic is probably referring to the many fan-made box arts. The idea of a Mario and Luigi game that features the Wario Bros, or a Wario and Waluigi spin-off seems to interest many people. Bowser still has the vacuum block. Does he? After Bowser's Inside Story, we never see him use it again, obviously outside of the remake, but at no point is it ever implied that he loses it. It's not too out of the question that he still has it, well, besides the question of why hasn't he used it in the other games. Piranha Bean is P.D. Piranha's child. Now, I'm not sure about this one, so I'll try my best here. The Superstar Saga boss, Piranha Bean, appears like a smaller PD Piranha. Design-wise, he's just PD with a regular Piranha Plant head. Maybe he's just a Bean Bean Kingdom variant of whatever type of plant PD is, like how other classic enemies in the game are noticeably off-model. Most places seem to refer to Piranha Bean as a different type anyways. It's not impossible that these characters have something to do with each other. But there's nothing to show that he's his child or anything. This is the most amount of thought I ever put into this character than I ever thought I would. Luigi Socks In the Mario and Luigi series, Luigi has striped socks. Something that's only seen in this series. Y yeah. The only other thing of note is that they, for some fucking reason, seem to be censoring them in the artwork of the remakes, despite them s still appearing in them. Okay, this is gonna be a long one. In Superstar Saga, the Star Beans Cafe is an optional area where the beans you collect can be used to brew coffee. The coffee can then be used to boost stats. A cutscene will trigger where Professor Egad will appear and try it, and then they'll insert some Luigi's Mansion references.
With that aside, in the game files it's shown that EGAD was originally supposed to show up for only one of these cutscenes. Other Nintendo characters were originally meant to show up and try it. These characters were Wario, Fox McCloud, Olimar, Samus, Link, and the racer from Excitebike. There is even leftover dialogue for all of these, including an unused one for EGAD, probably from when he was only meant to have one. Fox is gonna have both Slippy and Peppy call in, Olimar's gonna throw a Pikmin at Luigi, there were even unused gifts that would have been given depending on who it was. There are no sprites for these, but text exists that mentions them. EGAD was going to give a Game Boy Horror, which was replaced with a Game Boy Horror SP, okay. Wario was going to give Wario's Gold, which was replaced with Greed Wallet. Fox would have given a Golden Ring, which was replaced with a Bonus Ring. Samus would have given an Energy Tank, which was replaced with a Power Grip. Link would have given a Triforce, which was changed to a Great Force, with just one piece. The remake had all three pieces though, despite being the same item. And lastly, Excitebite vs Excite Spring, which was the only one that was actually used. Hi, me from the future here. Pausing just to say that Olimar would have given a UV lamp, which was replaced with a Cobalt Necktie. This wasn't in the recording because my dumbass forgot to write it down. The leftovers for all of these can be found in the game's files in the form of sprites, animations, and leftover text. All of these can be found in the current room floor, including the cut dialogue. Bowser X The final fight in Bowser's Inside Story's Gauntlet apparently bugs the fuck out in the German version. Let me elaborate. It is said that in European copies of the game, there is a chance that the graphics will glitch out in the Bowser X fight. From the UI messing up to the attacks from both sides, to Bowser turning into a weird amalgamation of enemies. Honestly, just look at this. Warum nicht? Oh nein! Der Grafik glitch. Oh nein! Der Grafik glitch ist doch noch da. Ich sehe den Angriff anzeige, ihr seht dann die Schaden anzeige. Ich habe keine Ahnung, wie viel Schaden ich noch mache. Also, ja, sehr schlimmer Glitch, wie man sehen kann. Ja, also, das ist nicht schön. Äh, gut, ich werde da jetzt so komisch geraucht hat. Und der wird größer, okay. Jetzt kommt das, was ich gemeint habe, was unfair wird. Wie bitte soll ich noch wissen, welche. F das ist doch totale Unfairness. It should be noted that this can happen in all languages, but each language has a different chance of making this glitch happen, with German being the highest. All that matters is that you have the PAL version, which. I just so happen to have. So yeah, I tried to see this one myself. And. Yeah, can confirm, it's real. I first tried it out twice with the language set to English and nothing happened. I tried two more attempts with it set to German, nothing happened the first time, but the second time after waiting in the battle for a bit and selecting Yuhu Cannon, it finally worked. Definitely a fascinating glitch. Alright, so from this point onwards, I decided to separate each topic into different categories. There will be extremely short topics that will take like two sentences to explain, topics with names that end up explaining themselves, which usually ends up being the ones that are just questions for you all to think about, and lastly, the joke topics. From now on, when we start each layer, I'll be doing a quick segment where I try to get all of these out of the way as quickly as I can, just so I can save the both of us time. That being said, we are now below the surface. Time for the topics to get more interesting. The entirety of Paper Mario is a fictional book written by someone in the Mario and Luigi universe. This has to do with the book that the paper characters come from in Paper Jam. This can correlate with the openings of the first two Paper Mario games that also start with books opening. Kozzle and Iggy Cooper. In Bowser Jr's journey during Cavi Cape Cave, Iggy gets knocked off a cliff by BFF. He is later seen in Plague Beach being discovered by Kozzle, who mistakes him for his lost grandson named Charlie. Iggy then gets cured, and then the plotline kinda ends. American version of Superstar Saga released before the Japanese version. Yeah, that's a thing that happened. 
For a reason I don't know, the American version of Superstar Saga came out first. Releasing on November 17th, 2003, meanwhile Japan and Europe got it on the 21st. Fallful could have redeemed himself in Partners in Time. We have pretty much covered all there is to offer in the Partners in Time cameo. However, I'm pretty sure this is just meant to be asking, is it possible that Fawful could have redeemed himself? Preventing the events of Bowser's inside story from even happening. Instead of going through with the plan that he's thought of for a long ass time, he just lets it all go. I'll leave you to think about it. Found in the files of Partners in Time is the unused enemy, Scoot Bloop, whose Japanese name translates to Land Blooper. It was first seen in the 2005 E3 trailer, shown for like, 4 seconds. But there's also a screenshot of it in a press kit, seen in Vim's factory. In the files however, it's placed with the enemies in Yoshi's Island and Yub's Belly. There exists a sprite sheet of it, both inside and outside of battle, as well as stats. Now despite being unused, the fight is somewhat functional. There is coding for it and it can be modded in. It's just unfinished. Scoop Bloop has two attacks, one of them is just ramming into the bros, and the other doesn't work as the game freezes before it does anything. I will leave a link to a video from Salafrog. The video is footage of them fighting the Scoop Bloops, but the description goes into detail about the fight and has the action replay code used to mod in the enemy. Oh shit, he's up there now. Wait, what happened to the... The Evoglobins are an evolved species of Emoglobin from Bowser's Inside Story. Only two are found in the game, they live in the Rump Command and help revive Bowser right before a giant battle gets triggered. They have these ribbon-like arms which were apparently given to them by... waves of spirituality. Whatever that is. There's nothing else known about them other than that. They look cool. They're... pretty neat. Yeah, shout out to the Evoglobins. Alright, let's recap a plot point from Superstar Saga real quick. After the first Cat Cleta fight at the middle of the game, it is revealed that the Peach seen in the opening of the game that got her voice stolen was actually a decoy. They saw Cat Cleta's plan coming, so they had Birdo as a decoy. Which is why the Bean Star went apeshit. With that being said, later on in the game, Birdo is seen again working with Popple, replacing the role Rookie had. But what's weird is that she... speaks after getting her whole ass voice stolen. A boss fight against both her and Popple triggers, then afterwards... Yeah, it's never mentioned again. She just fucks off and isn't seen again. It's mostly speculated to be an error in the story. It could be inferred that she got her voice back off screen, but from what we know, it could just be a plot hole. Though, definitely a small one. Tomato Adventure is an RPG released on the Game Boy Advance, released in 2002. This is Alpha Dream's second game. The game was never localized, only being released in Japan. However, in August of 2021, the game received a fan-made translation patch made by the user Demil. The game is mostly obscure, really only being known as the game they made before Mario & Luigi. It's still an important part of Mario & Luigi's history, as it's because of this game that the series even got made, with Nintendo themselves being impressed by it. The plot revolves around the main character DeMille, as he has to save his girlfriend from the King of the Ketchup Kingdom, using gimmicks as the main battle mechanic. If you remember back in Layer 1, we previously mentioned the four movie posters in Yoshi Theatre. In the remake, the posters were replaced, going from referencing other franchises to just referencing the other Mario & Luigi game. One of which being a potential romantic comedy movie, starring Brock Munchaw and Brock Medam, referencing a potential failed relationship before the events of Bowser's Inside Story. There was also an epic starring Dream Burt, an alien invasion movie, potentially featuring the Shroobs, and last of all, a fucking cheap cheap movie.
Those who've played Bowser's Inside Story will remember how when playing as Bowser, switching to Mario and Luigi will switch the music to an alternative version. Each area has an Inside Bowser remix, for when the brothers are being played as when inside Bowser. And Toad Town is one of them. I originally thought this was on here because it was unused or something, but no. It's in the game, but not many people have heard it, as seen in a couple of comments I've found from reupload. Of course, this makes sense. There is literally no reason for Bowser to be in Toad Town. There are no missions for him there. I don't even think he can enter the gate. So naturally, most people's first instinct is not to switch to Mario, it's to get the fuck out of there the moment they realise it isn't possible for Bowser to get in. That being said, this is a dope song that I'm pretty sure not many have heard. Doctors hate Kylie Cooper. A joke entry referencing Doctors hate her ads for anti-aging cream poking fun at the fact that she noticeably did not age at all from the events of Partners in Time to Dream Team. Unused Cloaked Beanish In the files of Superstar Saga, sprites from Unused Cloaked Beanish can be found. This one particularly has interested the community because of how mysterious it is. No name is given, there are no references to it in the code, and all there is, is an idle animation. No clue what it was meant to be. PIT Enemy Counters there is a mechanic that is exclusive to both European and Japanese versions of Partners in Time, where after you attack the enemy, they will immediately counterattack. An exclamation mark will appear above their head to signify this. Only three bosses have this though. Such a random mechanic to make this exclusive, but oh well. Catcletter and Queen Bee used to be lovers. Unlike the last ship topic, this one doesn't have a lot going for it, so this one will be much shorter. Throughout the game, Kakletta is shown to know more details about the castle than most other NPCs. Not only does she perfectly disguise herself as a Lady Lima twice, but she knows that fixing the castle's plumbing will cause the Beanstar to appear. Neither Queen Bee nor Prince Peasley call her degrading names either. Rather, they will only do such to her assistant, Fawful. With that stated, fans speculate that Cackletter and Queen Bee originally had a close relationship with each other. Some believe Cackletter to have originally been a servant of Beans akin to Lady Lima, while others will go further and state that the pair used to be romantically involved. Either way, if the theory is in fact true, an unknown event caused the pair to split. I yes, I have been reading the shipping wiki word for read this whole time. If you've played Superstar Saga, then you'll probably remember the part where after clearing the Geno minigame, Mario gets poisoned by a mushroomy one. This causes a quest where Luigi has to go on his own to find a cure. The poison mushroom is presented as an Invincer Shroom by the guy running the arcade. With this in mind, it wouldn't be a surprise if this guy is actually working for Fawful and gave it to Mario on purpose, knowing that it was poisonous. That is... if Minions Quest didn't exist. Yeah, Bowser's minions decide that it wanted to explain how this happened. During the Tihi Valley area, a toad who works for the Fungi Town Arcade says he is looking for new prizes and asks the minions to go into a cave to look for an invincibility mushroom. He finds it along with the poison mushroom, which he ends up picking up instead, mistaking it for the invincibility shroom. So canonically, this entire part of the game was the fault of Captain Goomba's dumbass. First he caused the rookie incident, and now this. All this being said, I wouldn't be surprised if this was true. Before the remake kind of retconned it, I feel like most people suspected this weird ass looking dude. I don't know, he just looks like a cunt. But as of this timeline, Arcade Guy Vindicated I guess. At the beginning of Bowser's Inside Stories, Pump Works, there is a tiny gap that you can't go between. The map implies that there is something down here. Those watching this who have beaten this game will have figured out that you need the drill to get in there. Which yeah, it works. But I assume the reason why this is on this iceberg is that most people would have completely forgotten about this area by the time they unlocked the drill bros. So maybe not many people have seen this area. I assumed I did when I inserted my decade old copy and opened my save file. Turns out I didn't. 
and I played the shit out of this game back then. After the tutorial fight against Antasma in Dream Team's opening, we meet the returning character Brock Monsure. After we're to get a whole gauntlet of tutorials. One of the main complaints I remember seeing when this game came out. One of the thousand tutorials is when Brock sends an enemy to attack you, which starts a battle tutorial. What's noteworthy is that right before, he switches to being oddly antagonistic, with a purple aura around him, sending the enemy with the intention of killing Mario. He even starts speaking like Antasma. Yeah, at this point you get where this entry is going. Maybe after the tutorial fight he possessed Brock or something? Maybe he possessed them since the beginning, and lured them here as a trap. That's the only conclusion I can come to. Let it blow. This is a line uttered by Starlo during the Smodergeist fight. At the beginning, she gives a short tutorial regarding challenges. Then she talks about how the bros won't be able to touch Smodergeist due to him, well, being on fire. She decides to help out by yelling, let it blow, which summons wind, which blows out the fire. The bros then just stand perplexed, wondering what the fuck just happened. The funny thing is, in the Japanese version, the dialogue here is pretty much the same, but instead of saying let it blow, she says... The futon was blown away. Yeah, apparently this was meant to be an intentionally bad pun. So from, from what I've gathered, the scene was originally using a common trope where a character would make a bad joke, which causes the characters to react with silence, usually so quiet that you can hear the wind as if it was amplified. So the joke here is that she intentionally makes a pun so bad it literally summons wind to blow up the fire. The localization team probably assumed the western audience wouldn't get the pun, so they opted to change it to let it blow. Wasn't expecting this random ass scene to have lore, but we move. The Who Hooligans from Superstar Saga and Who Skis from Dream Team have a strong resemblance to each other. The Who Hooligans have more of a cactus look, or maybe as the Mario Wiki says, likely designed after upright beans. The Who Skis look more like statues. Speaking of which, both strongly resemble the Haniwa, Japanese clay figures that was well known for their religious implications, although nowadays they are mainly known for their historical significance, and some of the designs that they've inspired in media. Even Nintendo have noticeably took inspiration from these, with the chance that even Alpha Dream has with these two, though mainly the Hooskies, with Haniwa Zoku apparently being their Japanese names. I'm not 100% on that, someone can correct me. So they have similar designs and names. I don't think I gotta tell you that people quickly notice this. With one theory I read about, states how Pillow Island could be located in the Oho Ocean, which is where Superstar Saga's Bean Bean Kingdom is located. One of the things that fans speculate about is Forfall's opinion on Cacletta after the event of the first game, with some coming to the conclusion that he was planning to overthrow her. At first this was hard to prove because of how little she's mentioned in the other games, but when the remake came out, there was something that people pointed to as potential evidence. In the last area of Bowser's minions, the minions get trapped underneath the floors of Bowser's castle, where we also see a factory making beta versions of the McCall Force from Bowser's Inside Story, which we also see much earlier in the game destroying the town. Fans speculate that this was all without her knowledge and adds to this theory. Gimmick Land was a Game Boy Color game that was the second game Alpha Dream worked on. However, it ended up being cancelled. Here is a timeline of events. On March 9th, 2001, Alpha Dream released their first game. Shortly after, Nintendo wanted their permission to make a new RPG with them. That RPG being Gimmick Land. The game was pretty much finished and was almost ready for release. However, what got in the way was the release of the Game Boy Advance, essentially making the color obsolete. This was common. Game production's been halted because of a new console. This would usually end with a game being redeveloped for said new console, or flat out cancelled. However, Nintendo asked Alpha Dream to redevelop Gimmick Land. They did, and Gimmick Land would eventually become the game we now know as Tomato Adventure. That same game that was mentioned earlier. The game was officially released on January 25th, 2002, on Game Boy Advance, only in Japan. So yeah, Gimmick Land was a prototype of Tomato Adventure, but that's not the end of the story. 
There's also the whereabouts of what was finished with Gimmick Land. This game became another piece of lost media, with only two very low quality screenshots of the game being the only thing out there. That is until January 24th, 2020, when the game ended up being one of... many things leaked during the Giga Leak. A data breach where gigabytes worth of files were stolen and leaked, which quite frankly, is an iceberg in and of itself. The unfinished prototype was leaked. It was called Gimmickland Tomato Atama no Himitsu, or Gimmickland Tomato Head Secret. If you want to know more about this prototype, then check the description for a link to the Cutting Room 4 page on it. Take a shot every time this website's mentioned. On August 4th, 2022, a fan made English translation patch was released by Reddit user Tomato Adventure Fan. So if you wish to play this for yourself, then go nuts. The Oho Gods Located in Superstar Saga's Oho Oasis, the Oho Gods are the two beings that live in their own temples, and grant Mario and Luigi their fire and lightning abilities, Firebrand and Thunderhand, which also happens to be the names of their techniques. Every civilized species has Mario and Luigi counterparts. Throughout the series, duo characters dressed in red and green tend to show up a lot, usually to give a tutorial to the player and demonstrate a new mechanic. Now with this in mind, Imagine if it turned out that every species has at least one of these counterparts. At least one duo whose sole purpose in life is to teach them something. Certainly a thought. Vim. Vim is the blood of the toes that the shrews use to power the technology in Partners in Time. Now let's redo this entry using Peggy 3 language. Vim is the life force of the toads and has only appeared in Partners in Time. The shrews end up using this to power their UFOs. Without it, the toads will unalive. By looking at the tubes in Vim's factory, you can see some toad spirits. Vim was also drunk by Swiggler, an elder princess shroob, to become more powerful and restore HP. Massive Bros faking their accent. The Massive Bros, the Russian hooskies that say beef a lot, they could be faking their accents, you never know. When disguised as the shell top, Big Massive perfectly faked the accent, so maybe. Smolder Guy Smotive. Does he even have one? Jokes End is the Frozen Palace from the first game, that can only be accessed through surfing, or a warp pipe. It is definitely an eerie area, that definitely stands out compared to the others in the game, and is a great tone setter. Considering it's the second to last area in the game, the owl plays name, Jokes End, compared to the others, which are named after forms of laughter. Then there's the fact that the palace seems to be only habited by Jajora and her friends. However, one line of dialogue indicates that there used to be more occupants. Besides the enemies and the Beanish visitor, no one else can be seen. Jokes End is also known as a graveyard for bad jokes, despite the fact that no jokes can be seen. This, along with the name, adds to the theory that Jokes End is literally a cemetery. Now let's go over one of the franchise's earlier fan theories. In the ending of the original Superstar Saga, at the end of the credits, the camera pans out showing Yoshi's in Yoshi Theater watching the credits. The remake's opening starts in Yoshi Theater, with them watching what looks like the opening of the original GBA game. Before Mario and Luigi show up, jump into the screen, then it transitions into the remake's title screen. There are three interpretations that fans made from this. One, that the Yoshis turned what happened in the game into a movie, and the end credits were them watching it. Heck, maybe the remake is said movie. Maybe that M&L movie seen in Yoshi Theater's poster room. 2. This caused some fans to think that in-universe, the events of the Mario and Luigi series are just movies. Confirming that they aren't canon. Maybe the remake's opening supports this. 3. That this means nothing and they just wanted to reference a past location. I'm more in the bow of the third one, but it is hard to discuss a theory like this without looking like you're looking too deep into it. This is one of those theories after all. But hey, not a bad theory to think about. Mushroom Kingdom's economy is busted. <laughs> I am really talking about the economy in a Super Mario video. I can't be asked. We are really covering everything here. Is the Mushroom Kingdom in an economic crisis? 
Remember how worthless Mushroom Kingdom coins were when converted to Bean Bean Kingdom coins? At the beginning of Superstar Saga, we are forced to pay Tolstar 100 coins, but at first it doesn't work, as 100 Mushroom Kingdom coins is apparently worth 10 Bean Bean Kingdom coins. Coins can be found everywhere, tossed aside on the ground all over the kingdom. There is a clear inflation problem, and the citizens of the Mushroom Kingdom hold no value for their own currency. It's very much not unlike the Weimar Republic before its collapse, or the current situation in Venezuela. It should also be noted that later on in the game, 1 million Mushroom Kingdom coins also goes to 99 Bean Bean Kingdom coins, so maybe the value went down after news about what happened to Peach got out? I'm fucking not. Okay, I'm looking forward to covering this one. Definitely one of the weirder parts of this franchise's history. So one of the big selling points of Superstar Saga was its humour. With it being the third Mario RPG, the game was definitely more light-hearted compared to the previous two, with a big emphasis on its comedy. And one of the ways Nintendo decided to market this was by hosting a knock-knock joke contest in October 2003, one month before the game would come out. Reports were saying that Nintendo is starting a knock-knock joke competition on Superstar Saga's website, www.gameboy.com slash Luigi. The website is now defunct, as going there redirects to Nintendo's website. It was hosted by comedian Kathy Griffin, who would pick out the winner. In the span of three weeks, she would pick the funniest joke she saw each week, with three finalists. On the fourth and final week, she would pick the winner. The two semi-finalists would win a free Game Boy Advance and a copy of Superstar Saga, while the winner would walk away with a Nintendo GameCube, three Nintendo GameCube games, Warrior World, Mario Golf, Total Assault Tour, and F-Zero GX, three GBA games, Pokemon Pinball, Super Mario Advance 4, Super Mario Bros. 3, and Donkey Kong Country, a Game Boy Player, a Nintendo GameCube Game Boy Advance cable, a memory card with 251 blocks, a Nintendo GameCube Messenger Bag, and a year's worth of online comedy writing classes at the Writer's Village. Now that's nothing to laugh about, I found a Neoseeker thread of people reacting to this, and even writing out their own attempts that they would submit. After four weeks, one day after the game came out in America, the winner of the grand prize was announced. Check one, two, check one, two, four. <gasps> Mario and Luigi are doing what they can. Yoshi and the princess are giving them a- No, I'm kidding. <clears throat> Mario and Luigi knocked, and the budding comedians of America answered. After sorting through all the entries in their month-long knock-knock joke contest, Mario and Luigi have selected the funniest of the funny as finalists. The brothers chose to host a knock-knock contest because of the hilarious back-and-forth comedy found in their new game, Mario and Luigi TM Superstar Saga, in stores now. Comedian Kathy Griffin, Mario and Luigi's new celebrity judge, has chosen a grand prize winner, who will receive an amazing prize package, and that's no laughing matter. And here is the winning joke, along with Kathy Griffin's reason. Knock knock. Who's there? Pencil. Pencil who? <gasps> Your pencil fall down if you don't wear a belt. <gasps> I feel inspired by this joke. Not only to wear pants with an elastic waist, but to really listen to others about my personal style. Also, I like the notion that the pencil is a character in the joke. It's almost like a person with a funny name. When I think of naming my first child Pencil, I'm laughing already. That's the idea, get it? Congratulations! Your pal, Kathy Pencil Griffith. As I mentioned earlier, the website is now defunct, but there does exist an archive on the Wayback Machine after the winner was picked. <laughs> How did Starlo know Fawfaw was transformed after Bowser defeated him? Good question. She never saw him in his bug form. Well, at least, not until the final fight. Dream Bird possessing Luigi. This one will be short because I'm not sure what it's talking about. Maybe when he's using Dream Bird to go to the Dream World, he's being possessed or something. One Toad still has the Blorbs. The Blorbs are a major plot point of Bowser's inside story, pretty much what kickstarts the story of the game. But is there a possibility that One didn't 
get cured. There was one in-game that it appears that it didn't, but he says he always looked like that, so I don't even know. Kamek confiscated Bowser Jr.'s power paintbrush after the events of Mario Sunshine. In Bowser Jr.'s journey, Junior receives the power paintbrush. He uses it when selected as a ranged trooper. The paintbrush is first seen in Mario Sunshine, where it is used to graffiti the whole island, kickstarting that game's conflict. Back to Junior's journey, Morton gives it to him, and then Junior gets confused of where he got it, and why it wasn't given to him sooner. It could be speculated that the reason why he didn't have it in the first place is because it got confiscated after the damage he caused with it in Sunshine. Wiggler Boss Fights for whatever reason, every Mario and Luigi game has a boss fight against a Wiggler. Y yes every single one. There's the original Superstar Saga fight in Chakohag Woods, the fight against the Swiggler in Partners in Time. Now how true you think this entry is depends on if you count this one. Which I do. Then there's the Bowser's Inside Story fight against the Wiggler that gets pissed at Bowser, followed by Dream Team's optional fight against Wiggly Wiggler and Popple. And lastly, the fight against a brainwashed Wiggler and Paper Kamek in Paper Jam. She better not die! No, 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 no. No, 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 no. God dang it, Nintendo. I love seeing comments from people just realizing this and questioning why. I can semi understand this. It seems like such a random character to be a returning boss in all five games. The lights, and it had the Goomba with the wings. And I, I actually said it here. Woohoo University was a front for weapons factory. Superstar Saga's Woohoo University is a university in the Bean Bean Kingdom, dedicated to the study of laughter. This is the area that gets taken over by Cackleder and Fawful, and where the Bean Star was located. I'm not entirely sure what to say about this entry, but it is an interesting idea. Plus, the fact that a portrait of Fawful appears in the remake, implying that he went there, probably adds to this. Maybe he was a student here. Feral versus Domesticated Bee Hoss. The Bee Hosses are enemies that come from Bowser's Inside Story, but make a reappearance in Dream Team. But the ones in Dream Team are way more aggressive, and are redesigned to look more intimidating. Now for game design reasons, this is because of difficulty. The Dream Team ones appear in the second to last area of the game, the Summon Woods. But maybe for canon reasons, this is because the Pillow Island variants are naturally feral, compared to the maybe more domesticated Bowser's Inside Story versions. In the files of Dream Team, three unused bros attacks were found. All three would have been returning attacks from the previous games. Partners in Time's Ice Flower, and Bowser's Inside Stories, Yoohoo Cannon, and Jump Helmet. Leftover sprites were the only remnants of these. The Ice Flower's sprite sheet looks very incomplete, and likely scrapped early on. The first two rows imply that this was going to be one of those 3D attacks, like 3D Green Shell, which was also a remake of a past attack. It shows the two of them running away from the camera. Then there's the rest of the sheet, which looks like they're... flying for some reason? It's hard to tell what this attack was going to look like, considering it's unfinished. But right now, it seems the only thing here that actually has to do with the attack is the flower itself, which I suppose was going to be the icon, or show right as they use it, like the fire flower. The Yoohoo cannon looks more finished. It looks like a traditional 2D attack, maybe an exact remake of the previous version. Mario and Luigi sprites look decently finished, but a thing of note is the cannons, which look directly taken from Bowser's Inside Story. They are probably going to edit these into Dream Team style, but never got there before scrapping it. And lastly, Jump Helmet, which looks almost completely finished. This is going to be another 3D item. It's probably going to control the same as the previous version, but they will also move from left to right, the reason why any of these attacks were scrapped are unknown.
Palladium, self-destruction boo biscuits. In Dream Team, towards the end of the Palladium fight, it will activate some sort of self-destruction. It will blow itself up in 40 seconds if you don't kill it in time. Obviously it kills you by doing that. But if you eat a boo biscuit, the item that temporarily makes you invincible, the self-destruction doesn't do anything. Th then you just win? Evil Cows. This is referring to a line from Partners in Time. In the scene where Baby Bowser starts choking on cookies, and is offered milk by Kamek, who insists that it's from, quote, an evil cow. Said evil cow is never seen. But we can imagine, I guess. I don't know, maybe the bullies. M maybe. Look at this fan art. Dream Beat Psychological Warfare. Only seen in Dream Team, Dream Beats are a type of music in the game that makes whoever listens to it fall asleep. Used at the top of Mount Pajama Jar by the bad guys. It works on Luigi, but Mario somehow fights it off before opting to go into the dream world. I'ma play the audio real quick. Donkey Kong is dead. Whoa, whoa, God. Okay, in all seriousness. This refers to the skeleton Kong named Bink. Bink is a member of the SS Chocola and appears in the barrel minigame needed to get a membership card. The only connections Bink has to Donkey Kong is that he throws barrels and eats bananas. Fawful is hiding in a Z-Keeper costume in Dream Team. At the beginning of Dream Team, during Mario and Luigi's entrance to Pillow Island, there is a Z-Keeper costume guy who says, quote, I have excitement, spoken in the exact same way Fawful speaks. This is definitely a coincidence since Fawful died in the last game, but it is a funny thought that this is what Fawful decided to do after the events of the last game. What happened to Midbus? The whereabouts of Bowser's entire story's secondary antagonist is still unknown. Midbus was last seen after the last battle with him, which ended with him being frozen in a block of ice. Despite repairs taking place at the end of the game, we still don't know what happened to him. This is something that's been speculated about for a while. So what happened to Midbus? A toad repairing the castle was bound to come across him. Did the ice melt away and he escaped? Will he return in another MNL game? Perhaps as the main antagonist. Did he die in that ice block? I think they probably just threw him out with the trash. I think he died in the ice block. The toads cooked him and the bros ate The best fitness friends, or the Brute Force Federation, are the main antagonists of Bowser Jr's journey. Not much is known about them or the relation to Fawful, but in an interview with Alpha Dream, a developer would go on to say, the truth is is that they are the same species as Midbus, which is why they have the same skin colour, but their relationship with him has soured. Anything related to that, much like Fawful himself, is shrouded in mystery. There's not much that hints at what this entry is saying, Besides what was just mentioned, their appearance, and maybe their names. Those who've played Partners in Time, remember the Shroob dialogue? And by dialogue, I mean the complete fucking gibberish. The Shroobs speak in a language that we are not supposed to understand. A way of keeping them more mysterious and ominous. Their dialogue is spelled out using small picture text, and audibly, the audio clips are complete gibberish. However, there are two exceptions to this, the first being Elder Princess Shrew, who speaks clear English, although in all caps. So she's probably screaming all the lines. The second is, well, regular Princess Shrew, who although uses the same language that the rest uses, her dialogue is actually translated, so we can read it. Now, some people have used this to try and find out if we can use this to potentially translate the others. Decode the whole Shroob language. Maybe we can also speak in Shroob one day. And yeah, it's mostly just gibberish. But there is one word that noticeably isn't. One word that is repeated several times throughout the game. And that word is destroy.
One of the more popular topics with people who fixate on scrap slash unused content in games is the test slash debug room. Rooms, levels, and menus, only to be accessed by the developers, dedicated to testing certain features. These are usually completely removed from the game when it's finished, but some are accidentally left in, only accessed through hacking or cheating. This series has quite a few of these, Pretty sure this entry is only referring to the three that all share the same purpose. Though I'll be going over select others, mainly all the other ones from the first three games. This is going to be a long one regardless, so skip here if this doesn't interest you. As of right now, from what we know, Superstar Saga has six, Partners in Time has seven, Bowser's Inside Story has one, and Inside Story's remake has five, though I'll be skipping these. It is currently unknown if the other three have any. Starting with Superstar, this debug menu takes you to what looks like the Star Beans Cafe blending screen, where you set the amount of beans you're adding. This serves as a cutscene tester, though not all of them work as some crash the game. At the time of me writing this, they've only documented the ones that the fourth one takes you to. And since I can't be asked to do the rest myself, I'll just move on to the other five the game has. This one is a really buggy room meant to test different stuff, mainly platforms and slopes. There is also this cage box, assuming to test a drill, an area to test small Mario, as well as these weird blue sticks. Popple can also be seen on the hill in the top left. It should also be noted that the slopes don't work. You start off at the very left of the room as Mario only. There is also no music playing at all. Walking off the top will take you to the second room. It's the same room but altered slightly, and Luigi's with you. The second one seems to also test NPCs and battles. The sticks and floating slopes are gone. The other slopes though, actually work. Multiple popples can be seen at the bottom, who all don't do anything. There's also a beanie which triggers a battle with a Goomba which after winning, starts playing the file select music. Now all of the ones afterwards are basically the same as the previous two, but slightly altered, reusing the same terrain. Don't know why they wouldn't, creating whole new ones for a debug room is a complete waste of time. The first is basically a duplicate of the second room, but the NPCs are replaced with three functioning enemies, an Anabu, a Virus, and a Boo. Going off the top will take you back to the second room. Wait, what the fuck? Hi that. What? Wait, what the fuck? What the fuck's happening? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck. What the fuck? How did I? Okay. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Now I'm just walking on top of the map, okay. The next one is nothing special, another duplicate of the second debug room. This time there are no NPCs. The last one is to test the bicycle blocks, but it doesn't work. This one is another cutscene tester, similar to SS but you were given 5 options instead of 4. It uses a custom screen, also each of the five options have names, each one being named after one of the developers. TCRF have documented all of the warps this time, so if you wish to try it out then go ahead. If you can't be asked, I'll leave a link to a video from a Weibo who record themselves going through all of them. But one thing that's notable is that when selecting a number, the game names which warp is selected, including the ones that don't work, showing some scrapped area, three of which have E3 in its name. So yeah, I'm assuming they were from an E3 demo. This one is a completely empty area, with two floors, with a staircase and two slopes connecting the two. That's it. The next one is a room that is solely meant to test all of the overworld mechanics. Drill, flattening, ball, etc. Moving off the right will crash the game. But something weird happened where it accidentally rolled off the left, and it took me to a completely different unused room. One that's not even a debug or test room. This one reuses the first map, but there's actual things here. On the top floor there is a single boom guy, which triggers a fight with two shrew blitz. It should also be noted that the toad here actually uses a sprite from Superstar Saga. 
Interacting with him crashes the game, and standing on top of the platform will load a second room to the DS's top screen, then throwing the babies will teleport them to said second room. The room is a copy of the other one, but the bottom is empty, and the top has just two already pressed buttons and another SS-style toad. Touching it will bring them back to the bottom screen. The next one is one of two found in the debug room. By selecting Fujioka 5, or just the third option, you are taken to the same room. But there are two SS toads instead of one, and there are a group of Yoshi eggs. Touching them will make them bounce, or playing a hammer sound effect. The bottom toad does nothing, but the top one will move the camera to the eggs. And lastly, Fujioka 10. You will be taken to a shop test, which adds a single toad to the top floor. Talking to it will show a menu, and each option will take you to a different menu, and depending on the options you picked, you will be taken to one of the game's shop menus. The text is all blank though, so you won't know which one you picked. I'll just move on to Bowser's Inside Story. This game's one map takes place in Bowser's body, and seems to consist of a single platform and four blocks. It's another cutscene test that warps you places. The thing of note with this one is that this room is bigger than it seems. The blocks make it impossible to explore outside of one platform. Those who've hacked their way around this found that the room is much larger with 11 other platforms. Seemingly with... no purpose. I'll be ending the entry here. If you want to see the 5 from Inside Stories Remake, I'll link another Weibo video. As well as the current room. Why is there a Dark Star Shrine behind Peach's throne? Good question. At the end of the game, right when Dark Bowser becomes whole, he destroys Peach's throne, which reveals a hidden entrance that was originally hidden right behind it. After entering, we see that it leads to a secret tower, previously unseen. After reaching the top during the minigame fight, we see a shrine, seemingly themed after the Dark Star with dark blue colouring and ending on a circle shaped platform with the Dark Star's face etched on the floor, where the game's final fight takes place. So basically in the game's climax we see a whole Dark Star shrine that's just kinda that's just kinda been sitting there the whole time. Did Fawful even know about this? Why is this here? Well other than being an awesome backdrop for an iconic final boss. How long was it here for? Did it have something to do with when the Dark Star first showed up? Prior to this game's events? There is also the argument that Fawful did know about this, and in fact he's the reason it's here. But the game doesn't tell us anything so we are left to think whatever we want. Plus the fact that Dark Bowser had to destroy the throne in order to get there leads me to think that he had nothing to do with it, so I don't know. Pig mask logo on Midbus' shoulder. People have noticed that the logo on Midbus' shoulder looks very similar to the pig masks from Mother 3. Rookie is not Bowser. I'll just let the iceberg maker explain it. Rookie not being Bowser is mostly a joke because it's funny. When I was younger, I actually never connected the dots. I just thought Rookie was a weird new Koopaling. As obvious as this sounds in hindsight, you'd be surprised how many people didn't actually see the twist coming. Most of the time they were a kid, and honestly, I don't even remember if I saw this coming with my first time. After all, for me, it was a decade ago. Soul Bubbles. These adorable creatures that appear in Partners in Time. Don't they look a bit like the Star Sprites? I mean, they're both balls of legs that can fly. For example, Starlo, who first appears in the next game, Bowser's Inside Story. They look similar. This along with the Soul Bubbles' dead eyes and its grayer colors adds to a theory that the Soul Bubbles are fallen Star Sprites. The Miracle Cure. 
was originally meant to just be used to cure the blobs, but it ends up also destroying the Dark Star's barriers that were blocking Peach's castle. Then afterwards, it's never seen again. Now it's time to ask the question, what would have happened if it was used on the Dark Star? Would it have killed it? And if by any chance its power wasn't used up, why didn't they use it? The Sea Pipe statue is the only enemy in the game that can damage Bowser from inside. This gets brought up again later, like layer 18, so like not even this video. But there is an unused item that was meant to heal Bowser from within, maybe showing that this was not meant to be the only time this would have happened. Maybe other enemies could have done this. D. Bradley Baker voiced Fawful. Did he? I have searched, but I hadn't found anything that officially linked the two. Oh yeah, I should probably give an introduction. D. Bradley Baker is an extremely well-known voice actor who has voiced dozens of characters since 1989. His filmography is stacked. If you look through it, you'll potentially see something that you grew up watching. On top of TV shows and movies, he has voiced several characters in video games. And as far as I found, Fawful is not one of them. The only thing I've found that links the two are fan casting. So yeah, I don't know. Okay, so here we got a whole wiki page for a Superstar Saga movie. Here's the cast I was talking about. John C. Riley as Bowser is mad. Kathy Bates is a kind of player that's interesting. I'm getting as Toad's worth. Fucking <laughs> Bill Hader as Toad. And yeah, of course, Steve Bradley Baker as Fourth from Bobble. Damn, yeah, Bro really made a whole wiki page for a fake Superstar Saga movie. Super Mario Bros. The Superstar Saga is a 2010 American anime fantasy adventure film produced by DJW Studios and directed by Damon Walker and Adam Shankman. Based on the role-playing video game Mario Luigi Superstar Saga, it's the studio's first film to be based on a video game, as well as its first film to be released on a November day since 2002's One Lost Elmer. Is that a fake movie? Or not? Yeah. Super Mario Bros. The Superstar Saga was released in theaters on November 19, 2010 by 20th Century Fox despite its mixed critical reception. It proved to be a success at the box office, earning over $362 million on its, 400, uh, on its $49 million budget. That's amazing. Don't know, I'm assuming this is the person who made this website. Composed by Henry Jackman, but even had added a whole track list to the soundtrack. That's great. And yeah, and yeah, there's comments about the Mario movie right now. When, when was this posted? Okay. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. This is completely irrelevant to the entry, but out of curiosity, I looked up who actually voiced the character and found only one. Nami Funashima, a Japanese voice actress who apparently voiced him in Bowser's Inside Story and both remakes. She also apparently voiced Popple, but I don't even know how true this is. As the only other time he shows up post Superstar Saga are Dream Team and the remake. And there are no credits that mention Popple, with Nami's name not showing up at all in Dream Team's credits. But yeah, without getting sidetracked too much, Nami Funashima is the only known official voice of Fawful that I'm aware of. If there are any others, or if there's actually truth to this entry, then please let me know. Fawful used genetically modified swarms to make an army. Bowser's inside stories chain chawfuls as simply regular chain chomps with a, quote, swarm attached to its head. Now, I don't expect you to remember this next part because I didn't even notice at all until I started researching these things, but this isn't the first time a swarm has shown up. Remember these black worm creatures from Superstar Saga? Yeah, that's a swarm, but the ones in Inside Story are green and look more like Fawful, like a lot of the smaller enemies. These can be inhaled by Bowser and passed on to the bros. So what happens to the Chawful when the swarm is gone? Oh wait, it just reverts back to a normal chain charm. Is this thing what caused all of the minions to become fawfulized? And with that, we are done for now. And we have a lot more to do, but I need rest. Do not expect a part 2 to come out soon. This one took way too long, and this is not an iceberg channel, so I want to do other shit at the moment. Still trying to figure out what I want this channel to be. 
For those unaware, this video is a sequel slash remake of a video I made in 2021. One that just covered the first iceberg. A video that blew the fuck up in ways that I did not expect. It was my first fully scripted and edited video. And it did pretty well. Too bad it sucks and I didn't plan on making a follow up of any kind. I just wasn't interested in making any more icebergs. Then in 2022, with the combination of finding another one, and realising that the 20th anniversary was soon, I decided to come back just for this occasion. And I'm pretty proud of how this turned out. Let me know what I missed or got wrong in the comments so I can correct them when I do part 2. But until then, thanks for wasting your time by watching this dorky ass video. Alright, I'm gonna pass out now.